Thank you, Rebecca, and thank you, Rina, and all of the other organizers of this uh, meeting. It's actually wonderfully exciting to see so many people from such very different uh, positions and interests coming together to think about the future and to think about fundamentally reorienting some of the ways in which we think about very basic strands of how we manage the present and the future. The environment, of course, is a place where all of that comes together. So I'm speaking a little bit personally from the standpoint, from a standpoint now that's older than most of you in this room. I've been involved one way or another with environmental things from 1976 onward. That was the year that I graduated with a JD from Harvard Law School, having never had any exposure to environmental things, simply because law schools did not as yet think that environmental law was a topic, partly because environmental law was still in the making. So my first introduction was by being becoming an associate in a tiny environmental law firm. And then since then, I've gone through a huge lifelong trajectory that has caused me to reflect on not just what, you know, how, what to do to protect the environment, but also what it means to have a category of thought called environment with which we think about the human condition. And in, so I've lived professionally, more or less, as long as American environmentalism in its present guise. And I've seen kind of profound historical changes that affect the ways in which the younger people in this room are thinking about environmentalism. So back in the 1970s was the, the heyday of the environmental movement as we know it, the kind of heyday that resulted in the creation of the Environmental Protection Agency and most of the statutes with which we in America and actually many other countries throughout the world govern the environment, the foundations were being laid for international and global environmental governance in that period as well. It was a time of rising consciousness. And there were several factors there that no longer exist. So environmental problems were extremely visible, for one thing. And in America and in common law countries, that point about visibility has always mattered. People are more willing to act on problems that they see in their backyard. And certain things became sort of tropes. So a river catching fire became synonymous with a kind of pollution that you want to avoid. And smoke and smog, visible particles hanging in the air, especially over inner cities, that was something that people related to. It was also the period, very importantly, of the Cold War and hence the space race. And it was incredibly important, especially from the late 1960s onward, that people had the image of the whole Earth suddenly hanging before their eyes. So here in the second row, for instance, I see somebody with a t-shirt on, which is in a way a relic or a legacy, if you will, of that period. So it's often said that we learned to see Earth for the first time in that period. Now, I've done a lot of work suggesting that this, we have learned to see it for the first time is a, is a construct, that it is not the case. But nevertheless, I think it's true to say we learn to see the Earth in a new way for the first time. And so ideas of planetary stewardship or custodianship were new at the time, and people were just getting used to the idea of global environmentalism. Also important in the kinds of statutory structures that we put in place in the United States and eventually beyond was the idea that publics have a role to play in environmental thought. So one of the statutes that I consider a really important achievement of environmentalism in America was the very first major federal law, 1969, National Environmental Policy Act, or NEPA, it has become a sort of technocratic instrument. Many people have heard of environmental impact assessments. These have to be done before any major uh, activity is sanctioned by the federal government that will have environmental impacts. But in NEPA, for me, is an important value that transcends the technocratic act of assessment, and that is that this act of assessment has to be done in public. The public has to be involved in debates about environmental impacts. 
that to me, impact is not just a technical issue. You know, how much territory is going to be affected, what dosages of things will people be exposed to, all of that is important. But impact is also looking into the future. It's saying, we're going to have to take this action now, and it's going to have these and such ramifications for the future. So intrinsically, it's a futuristic act, and bringing the public in to reflect and debate and deliberate on that is a change, a foundational change in the nature of politics. It says, before we intervene in the earth, we should be bringing people together to discuss the future implications of this action taken in the present. And so I think that's a sort of political, in a sense, revolutionary moment. And part of the sort of next era that I want to talk about briefly is we seem to have retreated from that understanding of what our laws were trying to be doing. So from 1980 onwards, and certainly up to 2010, although maybe now we're seeing a different era emerging in this room and beyond, we retreated. We decided that there was one eminent, supra-eminent discourse with which to talk about environment, and that was economics. And this was the era of rising cost-benefit analysis. To be sure, much of our legislation had said that we had to balance risks and benefits, so this was part of the, the legislative mandate that government agencies received. But over and over again, whether in Supreme Court jurisprudence or in the actions of the agencies, or even in the actions of scientists, we saw a repeated acceptance that the right way to go about doing balancing is to engage in economic analysis. And to me, one of the striking developments intellectually of the latter part of the 1980s and beyond is that ecology embraced economics. And I've talked to some of the foremost ecologists of our time, some of them now holding very prominent positions in government, and they said that we, as ecologists, who are after all the more holistic of the scientists dealing with the environment, we get no traction in public policy unless we buy into economics. And hence, we have worked with economists to develop this idea of ecosystem services, which is to say, put a monetary value on the things that nature is doing for us, and then you will be able to get into the policy arena because suddenly you'll be talking in the common discourse of public policy, which really, really is economics. All right, so I don't need to um, talk to this audience about the problems of economics as the sole and supreme discourse for decision making. But, you know, so what do we do about it? Well, there are arenas where I think that the injection of energy, human energy, collective values might have an impact, and I would just say a few little things about these, and then let my distinguished colleagues take the ball and carry it further. All right, so one is the discourse of public-private partnerships. So I'm a lawyer by training. I think a lot about constitutionalism. I think a lot about the foundational principles that tie states to people. And it's a very basic point that we thought for more than 2,000 years, 2,500 years of the Western tradition, about why we delegate power to governments. We have not thought about why we delegate power to corporations, sort of taken for granted. That is the market, stupid. So when we do public-private partnerships, we have an imbalance that I think needs to be thought through. We thought about what our relationship to government is. That's the public part. We haven't thought about what our relationship to private is. So in these public-private partnerships, it's one thing to say that somehow the agenda setting happens in accordance with the kinds of values that I laid out underneath it. That is, publics are involved, the future is ours, we claim it through deliberation. It's a different thing to say that the Gates Foundation can claim the public agenda because it is a philanthropic organization which happens to have a lot of money. Okay? And, you know, there are things that we need to think through and one of the theoretical areas I work on is how do we constitute, reconstitutionalize a world in which the private sector now has as much power as the, the public, if not more. Secondly, I think that it is a sort of truism about modernity that we've lost the sacrality of our spaces, that we no longer have a language for the same. 
So this has a sort of weird impact on the environment. If you can claim that a place is sacred under American constitutional law and that it's part of your religion, you can actually protect it. So I think it's a huge challenge for those of us who are not part of a religious tradition. And you know, I was brought up with essentially no religious training, so I'm about as secular as anybody gets. And I resent the fact, in a way, that you're not allowed to claim public values unless you walk through the pathway of religion. I mean, it's great that some people feel they do walk through the pathway of religion to get there, but you know, we have to claim the space somehow. And when I was sitting across the way in the previous track, and people were doing pre-association about words that they associate with environment, it was interesting to see which words did not come up. Stewardship didn't come up, ethics didn't come up, government didn't come up, and policy came up, politics didn't come up. So, you know, I think that those other words are kind of important if we're going to reclaim for secular societies the territory of the environment. Um, a third point is precaution. That precaution is actually a quite good word, but we have let it be hijacked in this country by people who say, well, precaution is doing nothing. It's, you know, it's a pathway of facility. The Europeans in this audience, and I think there are some, will recognize that precaution actually can be a quite powerful proactive action, and we can talk in the Q&A about how to make that happen more. And last but not least, I want to sort of almost agitate against people who say there's no connection between theory and practice, and we shouldn't worry about theory, we should be worrying about practice. I think theory supplies a lot of the discourse and a lot of the conceptual language in which we frame how we think about things. And I think that one does have to change the theoretical foundations of our discussions about the environment. And that is something that we do in part through disciplines, but also in part through movements. Movements have been quite good at putting new language on the table in which people then start to think. So I think a more um, cooperative and savvy collaboration between what happens in universities, which are a repository of theoretical thought, and what happens in the worlds of practice. This is something that we need to think about. I have ideas that I think my colleagues will have much more concrete ones. Thank you.